أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Well, this is um, lecture 8, chapter 8 of the reign of quantity and the science of the times by René Guénon. Chapter 8 is entitled Ancient Crafts and Modern Industry. This chapter, <clears throat> as well as the chapter that follows it, the twofold significance of anonymity, as well as the chapter that follows that, chapter 10, the illusion of statistics, and indeed many of the other chapters that come thereafter. <clears throat> now, uh, the, uh, these are chapters in which René Guénon provides um, examples of the degenerative and entropic processes of the Kali Yuga, and he subjects them to scrutiny in the light of the chapters that come before. Um, <clears throat> chapter 8 in particular directly grows out of chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 6 was devoted to the principle of an individuation and there he argued that uh, the principle of individuation in the modern world and in the Kali Yuga is seen to be matter or Actually, he means quantity, matter or materia secunda, according to the scholastics. <clears throat> and that this is, in fact, an error, but this is the situation. The actual principle of individuation should be form. Uh, and in chapter 7, he talks about the, shall we say, homogenization and reduction of human beings um, to kind of vacuous nameless masses <clears throat> and their uh, transformation or transmutation, if you like, a kind of alchemical processing, although he doesn't use these terms, of human beings <clears throat> into mere units. And this uniformity is indeed the parody of genuine unity. So with the emergence of the mass man who is utterly vacuous and empty and therefore susceptible to any and all kinds of manipulation uh, in the form of propaganda and indoctrination by the uh, Dajjalic forces and uh, manipulation by them for whatever those Dajjalic forces deem to be strategically opportune, we have therefore the corollary of that in as much as the products that are the result of the of this quantified action of the mass man <clears throat> results in mass production and these products of modern industry are seen to be the complete and total antithesis the parody of what was made in ancient times in past ages um, even within the kali yuga before these degenerative processes reached, uh, uh, um, um, became th thoroughly more accelerated. Uh, so this was ancient crafts, and that is really what is the topic of, <coughs> excuse me, this chapter. So for uh, again, on makes the point that there is no common measure uh, between the ancient crafts and modern industry. There is a great contrast, he writes, between what the ancient crafts used to be and what modern industry now is. <clears throat> and it presents in its essentials another particular case and at the same time a practical application of the contrast between the qualitative and quantitative points of view, which predominate in one and in the other respectively. Here, Guénon introduces the notion of the artist and the artisan. Um, the distinction between the arts and the crafts. This distinction he deems as being something specifically modern and notes 
that the term artisan is more and more falling into disuse. To the ancients, he says, the artifex, A-R-T-I-F-E-X, was indifferently the man who practiced an art or a craft, but he was, to tell the truth, something that neither the artist nor the artisan is today. Why is that the case? Well, the activity of the artifex, the traditional craftsman, according to Guénon, was bound up with principles of a much more profound order. The reason for this is because the nature of the ancient crafts of traditional arts was truly qualitative. Whereas today, especially in the products of modern industry, it is the element of quantity which reigns supreme. Nevertheless, Genon continues, the moderns, for that very reason, narrowly restrict their conception of art and relegate it to a sort of closed domain having no connection with the rest of human activity. That is, with what they regard as constituting quote-unquote reality, using the word in a very crude sense, it bears for them, and they go so far as freely to attribute to art, thus robbed of all practical significance, the character of a quote-unquote luxury, a term thoroughly characteristic of what could, without any exaggeration, be called the silliness of our period. So it is important to understand that in every single traditional civilization without exception, every human activity of whatever kind was imbued with a sacred character. Indeed, oftentimes there were what are today regarded as mundane, neutral activities were in fact sacred, not only sacred, but it w but were had the character of sacred rites. And thus, every human activity in every traditional civilization was deeply imbued with metaphysical, symbolic significance because these activities all derived essentially from very profound principles. There is a medieval saying in Latin, ars sine scientia nihil, namely that art without science is nothing. Genon says that the science in question is, of course, traditional science and certainly not modern science, the application of which can give birth to nothing except modern industry. So this rootedness or attachment to principles, this rootedness of every activity in traditional civilization in principles uh, imbued that activity and in, uh, with the sacred character. And indeed, each such activity was transformed, if you like, or transmuted uh, to an entirely other plane and was not completely limited to the exoteric or the merely external manifestation of things. And it is for this reason that Ganon remarks that in traditional civilization, every kind of occupation was seen as a kind of priesthood. Now here Ganon says that if you really want to understand what is meant by the sacred character of the whole range of human activity, even if only on an exterior level, it is only necessary, he says, to turn to any of the traditional civilizations such as the Islamic or the Christian civilization of the Middle Ages. He says it is easy to see that in them the most ordinary actions of life have something religious in them. In such civilizations, religion is not something restricted, narrowly bounded, and occupying a place apart without effective influence on anything else as it is for modern Westerners.
On the contrary, it penetrates the whole existence of the human being. Or better, it embraces within its domain everything which constitutes that existence, and particularly social life, properly so called, so much so that there is really nothing left that is profane, except in the case of those who, for one reason or another, are outside the tradition. But any such case then represents no more than a mere anomaly. In the case of Islam, this is certainly true. Even seemingly mundane or neutral actions are preceded by the sacred formula Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah the infinitely compassionate the ever merciful there is a saying of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the effect that uh, any any action of any significance any matter of any significance that is not commenced with the bismillah rahman rahim the formula of which i just quoted in the name of Allah the beneficent or the uh, infinitely compassionate the ever merciful is cut off or however he said it. Cut off, meaning that it is Qalilul Baraka, that it is of little of little uh baraka or, or sacred benefit. Um similarly in Islam it is said that in the Malamalu bin niyat, that all actions are judged according to intentions. So traditional Muslims would always, and the ones that remain, would purify their intention, their niyyah, when they would do any action. That every action is in fact uh, a kind of ritual act, a kind of sacred activity, an act of worship, so that the whole of life becomes an ibadah. And this, of course, extended into the realm also of so-called mundane day-to-day activities, whether that would be a farmer planting uh, or tending his fields, or someone hurting their animals, or indeed a craftsman at work at his craft. And oftentimes people who were involved in such crafts would recite the Qur'an quietly as they um, completed their task, or invoked the divine name or something to that effect. Uh, moreover, the whole of the sacred law of Islam, al-Sharia, uh, you know, they talk a lot about Sharia law these days. But Sharia, the sacred law of Islam, literally means a path that leads to water. A path that leads to water. And that's a very important image in as much as Islam arose in a completely arid, barren, desert environment in which water was only available in oases, otherwise in the south where there were regular uh, seasonal rains. But that was it. And the Sharia, the sacred law, the path that leads to water, encompasses every aspect of Islamic life. And the chapters in these manuals of Islamic law begin with ritual purity and lead up all the way through uh, marriage, divorce, and even hunting, um, buying and selling, you name it. It's there. So this is very important. And the ancient crafts also, uh, in many instances, if um, at least in the Islamic world, um, um, I'm not sure so much about uh, medieval Europe, there was also often an initiatic dimension. So the craft guilds were also united with the uh, esoteric path in Islam or Sufism. Um, and all of this is nicely... Um, summed up with a term from another traditional civilization uh, which embodies a doctrine and that is the term and the doctrine of Svadharma or Svadharm. I think in Japanese there's a similar notion. Uh, there's the term Ikigai, like, you know, your reason for being. And Svadharma, is, Sva means self and Dharma or Dharma is, is it means way or can you mean religion. But it really means here, as uh, Genon glosses it, the accomplishment by every being of an activity conformable to its own particular essence or nature. And thereby it is eminently conformable to another term in Sanskrit, which is rita. Now, rita has the sense of, you know, it's akin to what you, the concept of natural law. 
in the terms in terms of a physical law of nature but also natural law in the sense of right action and in that sense of um, law of nature in arabic it would be analogous to the notion of sunnatullah the normative um, the normative you know laws of 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 god and so the term rita in sanskrit is also seen to be related to the term ritual uh, in English. These are all Indo-European languages. So a person must fulfill their svadharma. The, they must accomplish the activity conformable. Each person, he must, he must perform the activity conformable to his nature. And here there is another idea which is implicit, which he doesn't go into, which is that of the quadripartite division of humanity of any of, 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 of sorry of human society in every traditional civilization along the lines of an ascetic caste a warrior caste a merchant caste and a servant caste this is in contrast to the modern deviation in the Kali Yuga and he says on page 57, the very last sentence at the bottom of the page, indeed, according to the modern conception, a man can adopt any profession and even change it to suit his whim, as if the profession were something wholly outside himself, having no real connection with what he really is, that by virtue of which he is himself and not anyone else. According to the traditional conception, on the other hand, each person must normally fulfill the function for which he is destined by his own nature using the particular aptitudes essentially implicit in that nature as such. He cannot fulfill a different function, except at the cost of a serious disorder, which will have its repercussions on the whole social organization of which he is a part. And much more than this, if that kind of disorder becomes general, it will begin to have an effect on the cosmic environment itself since all things are linked together by rigorous correspondences. So here, herein we find the true root of modern alienation. But that this is an alienation which extends not just across the social domain, but into the cosmic domain as well. <laughs> So when you have a situation where you have almost everyone in society going against their svadharma, they're not doing what they are meant to do. This results in the situation of extreme disorder, extreme disorder. And it results in the complete and total dehumanization of man. And that's why these people who are especially involved in mass production factory workers for example there's nothing there the product is empty of any real humanity many modern people maybe they wouldn't agree with this because you know everything is almost i really there's very little which is not mass produced anymore i mean that's why i like handmade things that's why i have handmade carpets that's why i try to have as much as possible handmade things but <clears throat> they're becoming harder and harder to find and so probably the easiest way for a modern person to understand this, people who are very much in the modern mentality. In the matrix. In the matrix is, is mass produced food. Or if you just eat something, you know, so-called fast food. Mm -hmm. Almost anyone can see the difference between that and a proper home cooked meal because there is nothing human in that and processed food. But then on the other hand, you have this obsession with junk foods. People actually start, have started to prefer mm -hmm. at least some segments of humanity prefer uh, processed food fast food um, anyhow I was just trying to come up with an example <clears throat> so the modern conception he says can only logically lead to the exercise of a wholly mechanical activity in which there remains nothing truly human and that is exactly what we can see happening today and remember Gedon wrote this decades ago it need hardly be said, he continues, that the mechanical activities of the moderns, which constitute industry properly so-called, 
and only a product of the profane deviation, can afford no possibility of an initiatic kind. Further, that they cannot be anything but obstacles to the development of all spirituality. That's why the doors of spirituality are closed to most people today, because they are so busy mm -hmm. yeah. working these meaningless jobs, <clears throat> and they have very little choice, because they have no other way to survive. They are completely in debt. They have a car payment. They have a house payment, a mortgage. And even the time they do have, they're just zapped of all energy because of There's the job. Precisely. This is by design. Yeah. This is a Dajjalic satanic development. And then whatever free time they do have is spent in all sorts of dissipative acts so-called leisure time whether it's just wasting their time with some sort of social media some sort of television some sort of films and worse alcohol drugs the full range of 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 of, of human follies human um addictions and so forth uh, and I think that modern music also plays a huge role in this. <clears throat> it's a kind of Dajjalic, satanic, anti-Vikr. Because an anti kind of, an antithesis, a parody of the, of the invocation of the divine name. So you find many people today who know any number of songs by heart. And they often have them buzzing in their head, even if they don't have their earbuds literally glued with super glue into their ears and that's another reason why people can't sit still they're constantly humming some sort of a tune this is the complete parody and antithesis of the person who is immersed in the invocation of the divine name who has memorized the whole quran or extensive chapters of the quran and has memorized all sorts of litanies and orisons and so forth from the islamic or other tradition and and invokes and they have some sort of instrument for doing this and they're constantly involved in that, even if they don't have their their beads. It is not unusual in the Islamic world to find people who constantly invoke the name of God. And this is not something that is just confined to Muslims. I have encountered many, many uh, people from Tibet, not in Tibet, but in my travels in India, who constantly are reciting the sacred mantra of, of uh, Om Mani Padmi Hum. In, uh, in Tibetan <clears throat> and Tibetan pronunciation of a Sanskrit mantra. Now, whether you agree, whatever your religious commitments are, you may be a Catholic, you may be an Orthodox, you may be a Muslim, you may what have you. But the point is that Tibetan individual, in my estimation, is infinitely better than someone who is just immersed in the latest nonsensical pop song or hip hop fantasy. So this is what has happened in the modern world. We digressed a bit. Uh, of course, he is talking about <clears throat> ancient crafts and modern industry. <coughs> so there is an initiatic dimension to these ancient crafts as well. Um, in the next chapter, we will talk about this notion of anonymity because in an ancient craft, there is nothing <coughs> of the profane and base individuality of the person because the ancient craft actually is built upon a kind of self-nothing n-o-u-g-h-t-i-n-g a negation of ego and in that sense the person becomes truly anonymous and so for example in islamic calligraphy a person has to constantly just copy the model given to them by the master you begin with letters, then you begin with combinations of letters, then oh, certain in, words. In calligraphy? In Islamic calligraphy, oh, yeah. I didn't hear what Khat. you said. Yeah. yeah, in Islamic calligraphy. In fact, there's a correct way to even make a dot, because some of the Arabic letters right, have yeah. dots. And so there is an extensive uh, period of practice and apprenticeship, <clears throat> and hours and hours are spent in doing that. And I've attended calligraphy classes where there's a lot of modern people who are encountering this for the very first time. Many of them do not have the patience for it. Saying, what are we doing? And they realize how difficult it is. Well, so that <laughs> you can only succeed <clears throat> if you eliminate those aspects of your ego. And so you have to undergo a kind of integration 
of your uh, uh, of your powers of your possibilities, so to speak. And um, that's why in traditional sciences, uh, sorry, in traditional crafts, they attain such a high level. It can't be done quickly. Mm -hmm. There has to be an apprenticeship. <clears throat> So there has to be some some kind of destruction of self. Yes. In order to attain mastery. Absolutely. Uh, and there's a very interesting quote about that here. So inasmuch as the craft and the practice of the craft also involves a kind of platonic reminiscence and anamnesis, which is mentioned in the Mino, famous dialogue which is footnoted here uh, <clears throat> mentioning that again on says this these last considerations make it understandable this is the bottom of page 59 last paragraph these last considerations make it understandable that initiation using the craft as support has at the same time and as it were in a complementary sense a repercussion on the practice of the craft <clears throat> The craftsman, having fully realized the possibilities of which his professional activity is but the outward expression, and thus possessing the effective knowledge of that which is the very principle of his activity, will thenceforth consciously accomplish what was previously only a quite instinctive consequence of his nature, and thus since for him initiatic knowledge is born of the craft, the craft in its turn will become the field of application of the knowledge, from which it will no longer be possible to separate it. There will be a perfect correspondence between the interior and the exterior, and the work produced can become can then become the expression, no longer only to a certain degree and in a more or less superficial way, but the really adequate expression of him who conceived and executed it, and it will then constitute a constitute a masterpiece in the true sense of the word. <clears throat> Now, I think there's a perfect illustration of this in a beautiful book that was written by Titus Burkhardt, a very important traditionalist with a capital T author, and that's called Fez, City of Islam. This is the English translation by William Stoddart. Burkhardt originally wrote this book in German as uh, entitled um, Fes Stadt des Islams, I think was the German uh, title. What was the German title? Yeah, it doesn't give the German title here. It just says that, that, that the German version was published in, uh, by Urs, Urs Graf Verlag in 1960. So this is the Islamic Text Society edition, 1992. Uh, Burkhardt lived for a time in Fez when he was uh, a, a young man in his 20s. And he lived in Fez, and I think that was in the, 19, um, the 1930s. So he has a very interesting quote in this book. I can't find it now. <laughs> Just give me a moment. This has to do with a traditional craftsman who made a very humble object. And that humble object is a comb. A hair comb? Yeah. Oh, okay. C-O-M-B, comb. I think the extract speaks for itself. It is a rather long one, but I think it's worth reading because it illustrates everything that Gennon is talking about. And this is a living witness. This is something that happened in the 20th century. On page 76 of this edition, Titus Burkhart writes, I knew a comb maker who worked in the street of his guild, the Mashatin. Mashat is a comb maker. Mashatin, plural, Mashatun. He was called Abdul Aziz meaning slave of the Almighty, and always wore a black jalaba, the loose hooded garment with sleeves and a white turban, with the litham, the face veil, which surrounded his somewhat severe features, characteristic of desert dwellers. Litham was worn by Berbers mainly, I think, so he may well have been a Berber. 
He obtained the horn. So he made his combs out of horn. He obtained the horn for his combs from ox skulls, which he bought from butchers. He dried the horn skulls at a rented place, removed the horns, opened them lengthwise, and straightened them over a fire, a procedure that had to be done with the greatest care, lest they should break. From this raw material he cut combs and turned boxes for antimony, used as an eye decoration. Box? I don't know about box. It would be kind of a tube. It's called a mikhala. There's mm -hmm. like a needle. Would have made, been made of various things. Sometimes they're made of silver, and it would have that ground dust inside. And you put, and it's applied to the eyes by both men and women. It was a unisex um, form of adornment, and it is a sunnah, a practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he cut combs and turned boxes for antimony, used as an eye decoration on a simple lathe. This he did by manipulating with his left hand a bow. So there's no electricity here, which wrapped around a spindle caused the apparatus to rotate. In his right hand, he held the knife, and with his foot, he pushed against the counterweight. As he worked, he would, it says here, sing, but it means recite. He would recite Quranic surahs in a humming tone. Hmm. Very different from the alienating factory environment, right. where you're standing all the time, probably, you, you can't go anywhere. You can't take a bathroom break, and you have people on Amazon, Allah, sorry to say this, but relieving themselves in water bottles. Yeah. I learned that as a result of an eye disease, which is common in Africa, he was already half blind, and that in view of long practice, he was able to feel his work rather than see it. Very interesting. One day he complained to me that the importation of plastic combs was diminishing his business. Now he quotes him. It is not only a pity that today, solely on account of price, poor quality combs from a factory are being preferred to much more durable horn combs, he said. It is also senseless that people should stand by a machine and mindlessly repeat the same movement while an old craft like mine falls into oblivion. My work may seem crude, my work may seem crude to you, but it harbors a subtle meaning, which cannot be explained in words. I myself acquired it only after many long years, and even if I wanted to, I could not automatically pass it on to my son, if he himself did not wish to acquire it, and I think he would rather take up another occupation. This craft can be traced back from apprentice to master until one reaches our Lord Seth. He means Sayyiduna, Sheath, Sheath ibn Adam, Seth the son of Adam, peace be upon them both, alayhim assalam. It was he who first taught it to men, and what a prophet brings, for Seth was a prophet, must clearly have a special purpose, both outwardly and inwardly. I gradually came to understand that there is nothing fortuitous about this craft. That each movement and each procedure in, is the bearer of an element of wisdom. But not everyone can understand this. But even if one does not know this, it is still stupid and reprehensible to rob men of the inheritance of prophets and to put them in front of a machine where day in and day out they must perform a meaningless task. Consequently, the dire straits in which Moroccan craftsmanship finds itself is not merely an outward predicament. This is now Burkhart resuming his narrative. But above all, a spiritual threat. Even if not every Arab craftsman has as much understanding of his craft as our comb maker, nevertheless most professions still have a spiritual content, which will progressively disappear with the innovation of modern industry. Even the water carriers, who do nothing else but fill their tarred goatskins at the public fountains in order to offer a cool drink to thirsty people in the marketplace, indifferent as to whether they receive a voluntary token or nothing at all, show in their demeanor a human dignity, such as in European countries the sower may still have, as he contemplatively scatters his seed. I've seen such water carriers in Egypt. They're still there. Mm -hmm. Even the beggars, continues Burkhardt, who squat outside the mosques and on the bridges, 
and who reveal their profession by their much-patched garments, do not make their request with shame, but cry, Give what is God's, or intone to themselves in a monotonous voice a pious refrain. In Egypt, people say that, mm -hmm. Give me something for the sake of God. Some of them will say for the sake of Imam Hussein, because especially if they're begging in that area. Or someone will just sit by the side of the road saying not, and not make any appeal and simply recite the Qur'an. For almost everyone who has not been sucked into the whirlpool of the modern world lives his life here as if it were something provisional, which does not definitively engage his soul, but which belongs to the divinia comedia of earthly existence. It's a beautiful passage. Mm. <clears throat> I think that really sums up everything in this chapter. It really makes you think about tradition and that anybody who, who is living within a, a true tradition with a capital T, as Ganon would, would think of it, mm. um, no matter what their place in society, whether they're a beggar. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, that comb maker is a rich man. He seems to be a very humble man mm -hmm. in, his, in his life. In all likelihood, yes. But it seems to bring out a, a beautiful sense of culture and I think it really ennobles people mm -hmm. down, you know, from even from your, you know, more uh, wealthy people down to the, the beggar on the streets. If they both practice it correctly, I think it brings out something um, beautiful within, within a person. Extremely true. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is the concept, since we're talking about this example from the Islamic world of adab. Adab, yeah. Now, adab in Arabic means literature, but it also means etiquette. It also means a certain kind of deportment. Decorum. But, decorum. Yeah. But it originally comes from a root which refers to actually having a meal. Ma'duba. And ma'duba is, 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 is a location, so to speak, a physical space where you sit down to a meal. And it has the notion that, you know, there are... As we would say in, the, in, in, in English, in a cultural context, table manners, all the Muslims would sit on the floor. There would mm -hmm. be a table spread, traditional Muslims. Uh, but there's certain etiquettes that are observed. And naturally, you invite, um, presumably, you know, you would invite refined people to this gathering. And you have refined conversation. Mm hmm and people conduct themselves in a civilized it's leisure. manner. It's leisure and it's in a true leisure sense. in the true sense, as yeah. in as in the book by Joseph Pieper, Joseph Pieper, Joseph of Piper, culture, yeah. leisure the basis of culture. Yes. So I think that really sums it up. I want to stop here, but I, uh, just to complete uh, what Ganon had to say, he he winds up the chapter by um, <clears throat> mentioning the decline of of uh, sacred sciences, and since we were talking about Fez, city of Islam. You know, it's a traditional... I haven't been there, but I've been to other traditional Islamic cities such as uh, Isfahan or, you know, Old Delhi. So he talks about how, you know, there isn't... Just like there's mass mass industry, mass production, there's also a kind of mass architecture. Um, there's a profane kind of city planning. And none of that was there in, in sacred... In the, in the sacred sciences, there was, there was actually a method... Of laying out a city, uh, mm -hmm. there were astrological timings were observed. The symbolic nature of space, you know, what you find in the Hindu tradition of Vastu Shastra, which is like the Chinese Feng Shui, which a lot of people have heard of now in the in, in America. Yeah. So all of these the, things are gone. Yeah. Now this is talked about in chapter four. You can watch the lecture there. That's true. That's talked yeah. about in chapter four. So I think we'll just stop here. Uh, we could have actually just stopped with, with that quotation. That would have been a good place to end, but I did want to just point out the last point that he makes here. Um, this chapter logically leads into the next one on the twofold significance of anonymity. That's chapter nine. I hope that uh, people are enjoying this series. It is taking time to make it, but I do have uh, the intention to take it and see it through to the end. Um, so if you like this content, please do consider not only subscribing, liking, and sharing the video, but supporting this work on the on my Patreon or through PayPal. And uh, thank you again very much for watching.